So we come to my favorite slide. Now, so let's go into how dietary factors and toxins can contribute to mitochondrial dysfunction. Mitochondrial deficiency is common, especially as our agricultural uh, process goes forward. I grew up on a farm in South Dakota. And, and I think about the amount of pesticides and herbicides and things like that and fertilizers we used, you know, back when I was a young child. That was a long time ago. The process hasn't gotten any better. Our farming practices have leached many of our micronutrients out of the soil. And, uh, then this trickles down into our diets where most of the world's population, including that the U.S. is inadequate or one or more micronutrients occurring to, according to current intake recommendations. So what micronutrients are needed when you're dealing with mitochondrial dysfunction? The list is long because we're talking about the very energy production system of the cell. Therefore, diet is exceedingly powerful when we're thinking about improving mitochondrial function. Let me orient you to this slide. It's also very useful to think about. This is the intermembranous space. This is the membrane itself. And down here we have the matrix. All right, so hydrogen ions going up this way. First of all, fatty acids will come in through the intermembranous space. Um, uh, and it needs to be shuttled in via carnitine. So carnitine is present in meat, mostly. Uh, carnivore, so fats and high carnitine environments tend to come together. Riboflavin uh, is necessary as one of the B vitamins, uh, as it is the foundation of, foundation of FAD. And niacin is the foundation of NADH. Iron. Iron is, uh, you know, is present in several of these uh, molecules as they are heme groups, which enables hydrogen ions to go out. CoQ10 is now a shuttle that moves the, ion, moves the uh, electrons from complex one to complex three, but it also moves the electrons from complex two to complex three. Again, another backup system, uh, bypass system that we can survive. Uh, more iron in cytochrome C. And in complex four, we have not just iron, but copper. Uh, vitamin K and vitamin C are another minor bypass that can occur. And, uh, and finally, when we get to complex five, uh, the ability to finally make ATP requires alpha lipoic acid. And ATP itself uh, is a salt of magnesium. So it's, it's stored as a salt of magnesium. So low magnesium stores it and stable ATP. So we can recognize why we talk about nutrients so much when we're talking about mitochondrial function, because they're essential in every piece. And how much ATP do you make every day? Your body weight. This is a lot of processing going on. There's a lot of work, a lot of expenditure, a lot of damage, a lot of repair. This is a very active process. So the quality, the nutrient density of our diet is imperative to both maintain and protect mitochondrial function. Now, CoQ10 uh, is in, comes in two forms, ubiquinone, ubiquinol, and this is how it works, as that uh, CoQ10 is going shuttling back and forth from complex one to complex three, or from complex two to complex three. It, go, it becomes ubiquinol on one end, ubiquinone on the other. Ubiquinol, ubiquinone, ubiquinol, ubiquinone. It doesn't really matter which one you bring in, because as it's working, it's entirely, it's the process is being converted rapidly from one to the next. It's really about how much do you have available. Um, as, because as mitochondrial function goes down, your ability to produce CoQ10 also goes down. And you can imagine why we see the spiraling of disease moving forward. What are the major sources of mitochondrial dysfunction? Okay, how, do you, how does this system screw up? Well, it's first of all, oxidative stress. So the very thing the mitochondria produce is one of the things that causes it the most problems. So oxidative stress begets oxidative stress. Caloric overload, just, you know, flooding the engine is what you're doing with caloric overload, especially with glucose. You're flooding the engine. And what happens when you're behind somebody whose engine is flooded? You see big black smoke coming out the back tailpipe. Glucotoxicity. Too, too high a glucose will actually damage individual molecules via the process of glycation. I, I'm certain Dr. Roundtree talked to you about sticky buns. Fair? 
<laughs> and so the production of ages uh, that then trigger rages also cause mitochondrial dysfunction. Lipotoxicity, uh, so the, the damaged fats themselves will cause mitochondrial dysfunctions. Environmental toxins and micro, micronutrient deficiencies. So the list is long. This is why this is systems medicine. It's not a one, you know, one pill for one ill. It is really stepping back and saying, huh, why? How is the system dysfunctioning? And what are the multiple co, co-facilitating problems that we can remove and the co-facilitating solutions we can uh, entertain? So, um, oxidative, ra- oxidative radicals, uh, which are, uh, can damage fats, sugars, protein, and DNA. We can measure these in the blood, in the plasma, in the urine. Uh, one of the best measurements, tons of data on 8-hydroxydeoxyguanosine. Um, and uh, that is a marker of DNA damage. Fats can be measured as oxidized LDL, lipid peroxides, or F- F2 isoprostane. These are available from many labs, so you can quantify what is the level of current oxidative stress going on in, that, in your patient. Uh, but I love this last one, hemoglobin A1c. You really think of hemoglobin A1c as an oxidation marker? So as oxidation goes up, so does glycation. So an elevated hemoglobin A1c, which I'm sure most all of you have ordered or at least seen, you know, this is a great surrogate marker that something is going wrong, that in some point we're having an energy failure. Elevated hemoglobin A1c is such a global marker. It's so useful, especially if we start linking together um, hyperglycation being damaging, and also the elevation of blood glucose is really a manifestation of mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, we can look here also at micronutrient deficiencies. So do a serum, red blood cell, uh, plas- uh, analysis of, uh, of nutrients. All right, cyanide and carbon monoxide. What's the best delivery source we have in the current world for this? Cigarette smoke. That's an awesome way to be able to deliver both carbon monoxide and cyanide. So convenient. Two, two, two punches in one glove. And um, this was first identified as a mitochondrial toxin way back in 1940. It blocks mitochondrial energy production by displacing oxygen from heme. Now, where were the hemes? The hemes were complex 1, complex 3, complex 4, and cytochrome C. So all of those heme groups, not just hemoglobin, so you, when you get these uh, toxins in, um, it's, it's causing problems at the active sites of enzymes. And, and we'll find that anything that disrupts the hemes cause, uh, cause an issue. There, when we're thinking of mitochondrial toxins, if you want to kill something, do you think a good strategy would be to disrupt its energy source? It makes good sense, doesn't it? So therefore, herbicides... Pesticides, fungicides, any kind of cidal agents are very likely to have some kind of mitochondrial toxicity as their mechanism of action. So it's, it's an intentional killing force. And so th- now that works fine if you can control the scope and uh, duration of that and, and control where that compound goes. But as we start to see, but both like uh, MPTP uh, as a... a, a was one of the drugs that helped us both start to understand Parkinson's disease. Um, rotenone, a common, uh, common uh, cytal agent, peridin, paraquat, maneb, uh, influence very specific aspects of the mitochondrial uh, health and the electron transport chain. 2,4-D, oh my gosh. I remember as a kid actually climbing into a sprayer that we use for herbicides and washing the inside of the tank from the inside out. And so uh, my interest in mitochondrial toxins is very real. <laughs> and so atrazine, we see atrazine causing problems with sex um, um, selection in amphibians. Um, well, how might that occur? Could that occur by energy disruptive processes changing the formation uh, uh, intra, uh, I can't, we say, can't say intrauterine with frogs, uh, but intra, intra uh, cellular. Organochlorines, such as dioxins, disrupt signaling. Bisphenol A messes with complex two. And organophosphates are direct neurotoxins. 
Nice study, just putting, putting kids on an organic diet decreases attention deficit disorder manifestations. So how, when you start thinking about the component of your, how does the quality of your food, what's not in your food, manifest finally in cellular tissue, cellular and organismal function, um, it's important to think about toxins are almost always going to involve mitochondria. Uh, there's several metals that are important. Too much iron uh, is also going to be a mitochondrial toxin. Uh, mercury, lead, and arsenic. Uh, persistent organic pollutants, such as uh, cause mitochondrial dysfunction, and they're associated clearly with type 2 diabetes. Um, what, what's one of the blood markers that goes up as we see toxicity go up? GGT. So GGT is a good marker for uh, both insulin resistance uh, as well as overall hepatic toxicity. Well, what is GGT? It's gamma glutamyl transferase. It's the second step in making glutathione. So if you have high oxidative stress, the body will upregulate the production of gamma glutamyl transferase and start showing you that there's an oxidative burden present. Um, and so these, again, Here's another liver test that's really a, probably more a marker of mitochondrial stress uh, than actual organ damage. So these, this oxidative stress damages mitochondrial DNA, and then that has been shown to actually decrease beta cell function, cause insulin resistance, and eventually diabetes. How about toxins? Uh, acetaminophen irreversibly inhibits beta oxidation. Do you see how that could be a problem? And so think of the exposure of, of Tylenol in a child. How would that, how might that change multiple different cellular activities if their form of energy, uh, form of energy input gets manipulated by one pathway not being as effective as the other? Aminoglycoside antibiotics, antiretroviral drugs, aspirin, and statins all have their pathways. Um, cancer chemotherapeutic agents, so platinum compounds, metformin inhibits complex one, tamoxifen inhibits complexes three and four, valproic acid impacts complex four. So, um, you know, which medication do you know that doesn't have uh, uh, elevated liver enzymes as a potential uh, manifestation, right? They mostly all do because of this, of this process. But let's think about metformin. Metformin has this weak capacity to inhibit complex one. And this may be its actual mechanism of action of causing hypoglycemia. So when you slightly inhibit complex one, you can increase the ratio of AMP to ATP. But that stimulates AMPK. And AMPK is an energy sensor. And that will then inhibit the production of glucose, hepatic gluconeogenesis, and that will therefore lower blood sugar. But AMPK also will turn on PGCO1-alpha, which we'll learn later is actually something good for mitochondria. So, you know, there's some interesting data on metformin at low doses being very beneficial for longevity and other sources. So the difference between a toxin and, uh, and a... Uh, nutrient or, you know, something that's a mana and a toxin uh, is really dose. You know, what's the difference uh, at time, the dose and the person in which that compound is being exposed? So by listing all of these things and saying, well, this molecule does that, this molecule does that, it, again, it's all situational. When are these things friend and when are they foes are the questions we need to ask. Is that fair? Okay. So... So, very interesting study done on simvastatin and how it impairs exercise training adaptations. So, it's always a question, should I be on a statin or shouldn't I be on a statin? And, and so, these are effects that aren't usually spoken of very often, and this has been replicated several times. I encourage you to dive into PubMed. And so, 37 sedentary over, uh, overweight uh, result, uh, adults at risk for metabolic syndrome were randomized to 12 weeks of aerobic exercise versus exercise plus 40 milligrams of, of simvastatin. Now, in the exercise-only group, their cardiovascular fitness increased by 10%, along with 13% increase in skeletal muscle mitochondrial citrate synthase. Remember you mentioning citrate synthase? 
So they saw exercise capacity went up, citrate synthase went up. But if they re had, did the same exercise plus a statin, their cardiovascular fitness was blunted to only a 1.5% increase and a 4.5% decrease in citrate synthase. Now again, it, I'm never going to say something is, you know, a molecule is good or evil, but what in the context of that particular individual at that time, how do we best understand the complexity of the impact of our interventions is exceedingly important. So, but how do we recognize reactive oxidase species can affect mitochondrial function? So, Denim Harmon uh, proposed in 1965 the free radicals damaged these macromolecules and proteins, nuclear, mitochondrial DNA. And it's this damage to the tissue and the mitochondria that was, had the major role in aging. So essentially, the amount of oxidative stress equaled the amount of aging. He revised that hypothesis later on, um, you know, and uh, again, to center in that mitochondrial health really determines lifespan entirely. And it's hard to argue, because he died at 98. <laughs> I know that that's not a proof of anything, but it's, it's good for the story, right? <laughs> and so, if we think here, mitochondrial function you know, causes generation of reactive oxidase species. Those reactive oxidase species damage DNA, proteins, fats in the mitochondria, causing dysfunction, which makes more reactive oxidase species in a feed-forward cycle of dysfunction that essentially is aging. Now, we've already talked about all the things you can measure to to understand oxidative stress. Um, and if we recognize that each of us produce about a, a kilogram of free radicals a year, which doesn't sound like much unless you think of how small they are, because each, the consequence is about 100,000 oxidative attacks on our mitochondrial DNA per cell per day. So every cell, 100,000 uh, individual oxidative stress attacks that then have to be repaired. It's astounding. Our repair and resilience is just amazing. Um, love it. So these re reactive oxide species, what are they? So superoxide uh, is primarily generated by electrons escaping from complexes two uh, and three, or one and, one and three, excuse me. Uh, some of the oxygen that we make is converted to this oxygen radical, superoxide, and it will then be dismutated, made less reactive by a transition into hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is then uh, converted into water by either glutathione peroxidase or perioridoxin. Um, and hydrogen peroxide is very important in the cellular signaling process. Hydrogen peroxide can interact with iron, um, to form the hydroxyl radical, which is really nasty, short-lived but highly toxic. There's really not a good physiologic role for the hydroxyl radical because it just damages whatever it comes close to. Um, and any kind of oxidative radical, we can also have a nitrositive radical. So whenever we're thinking about oxidative stress, in your mind you should say oxidative and nitrositive stress. So nitrogen can do most of all the same nasty things that oxygen can. So what causes this oxidative stress? Well, uh, more, too much calories. We know fructose, uh, as a simple sugar, increases oxidative stress, as does alcohol consumption. And again, this may be where some alcohol is actually benefic beneficial. A little bit of stress and adaptation to that stress, as like exercise, improves health. But too much uh, now becomes a poison. Hyperglycemia impacts endothelium. Inflammatory mediators such as tissue necrosis factor alpha. Uh, what is inflammation? How does inflammation really work? You're, you're producing a whole bunch of hydrogen peroxide and oxygen radicals. Inflammation is essentially oxidative stress. That's how you burn something cellularly. And so wherever you have inflammation, you have oxidation. There's no question. Now, you don't necessarily have inflammation everywhere you have oxidation, however. Oxidation is a molecular process. Inflammation is more of a cellular and tissue-based process. If you're trying to separate those two concepts out in your mind, I hope that's helpful. And hypoxia, just low oxygen, both acute and chronic, causes increased oxidative stress. And, and hyperoxia 
can also cause mitochondrial stress. Too much, too little. Ionizing radiation, um, I hope you all think about it as you fly home. <laughs> Sorry to creep you out. But, the, the <laughs> but, ox but ionizing radiation directly breaks up water molecules and can produce these hydroxyl radicals. Um, toxic metals have as one of their toxic mechanisms of injury uh, the production of increased free radicals. It's very hard to actually understand heavy metal toxicity because there are so freaking many different mechanisms by which toxic metals screw up cellular physiology, and, and it's hard to know exactly how they're doing it, but they're, they're bad. So um, a free radical is essentially a molecule that has a missing electron. It's hungry. It's looking for something to make it complete. Complete me, it says. A little, little needy. I mean, it goes even beyond codependence here. So. Um, and the, so if we think about reactive oxidase species, uh, they're also signaling molecules. So a little bit may be helpful. Um, and where we can get a little bit of mitochondrial oxidative stress is exercise um, and glucose restriction and reduced caloric uptake. So a small amount of oxidative stress will prime what we call NRF2. NRF2 is a uh, signaling cassette that turns on our antioxidant enzymes. So some oxidative stress is helpful. A little more oxidative stress, now we're going to trigger NF kappa B, and we're going to get a resulting inflammation. And even more oxidative stress, we turn on AP1 and activate apoptosis. So dose is important. The same uh, process for one person that can be helpful can be harmful to another. Especially when you think about like chronic fatigue and the amount of exercise a person can handle. This is a really good example of that. How one doses something that is good for you uh, is, is necessary as well. So how do we deal with these oxidative radicals? So we have superoxide, and superoxide um, is broken down by superoxide dismutase. And there's two forms, SOD1, SOD2, and they're both dependent upon having enough minerals. Um, cytosolic superoxide dismutase uh, had, needs zinc and copper in order to work. And inside the mitochondria, there's superoxide dismutase that requires manganese. Uh, uh, mangane uh, manganese. Glutathione peroxidase is what breaks down hydrogen peroxide, finally into oxygen, and that requires selenium. And catalase, which is also breaks down hydrogen peroxide, uh, requires iron. Where do we get our dietary antioxidants? From brightly colored foods. And um, the more dense the color is and the more broad the palette of colors are, the more phytonutrients we're going to bring in that are direct antioxidants. They will take the hit. They will say, all right, you need an extra electron, I will give this electron to you. Um, and um, polyphenols are excellent at that. So mitochondrial biogenesis, so I mentioned already, it, we, we talk about making more mitochondria. It's really about making more mitochondrial mass. And uh, our cells are always going to regulate how much mitochondria is present based upon energy needs. So if there's a, an understanding that there's a deficiency of energy, the, the cell is going to be encouraged to make more mitochondrial mass. And this is governed by a, uh, a hierarchy of transcriptural factors which are dependent on PGC1-alpha. So there's, you've recognized there's been an alphabet soup that you need as hubs of understanding process. So for instance, NF-kappa B, that was a hub went over in the um, inflammatory section. Uh, NRF2, we'll learn, turns on a whole bunch of your antioxidant enzymes. PGC1-alpha is central in the process of mitochondrial biogenesis. You don't have to know everything but create these hubs of information to start making your connections with. PGC1-alpha is a master regulator of mitochondrial biogenesis and energy homeostasis. Um, most nuclear genes coding for mitochondrial proteins have a binding site for PGC1-A. So it's, um, it turns on a host of genetic expression. And, it's, and the more mitochondria are present in a tissue, the more PGC1-A will be activated. 
So when does it go up? It goes up with exercise, with fasting or starvation, with cold exposure, and also with you know having act or activated T3 or the hormone adiponectin. And when PGC1A turns on, it turns on the capacity for beta oxidation, right, making burning up fats, and then also oxidative phosphorylation, which is the process of taking oxygen and enabling the phosphorylation of ADP to ATP, um, antioxidant protection, and all the uncoupling proteins. So PGC1-alpha will actually turn on NRF2 as well to help make a, a, a backup system to prevent oxidative stress. So it's also interesting that PGC1A is localized. So exercise turns on the PGC1A in the heart and the skeletal muscle. Fasting affects the liver more so. And cold exposure really turns on PGC1-alpha in the, the adipose tissue. So it's not as if there's just one strategy that's going to fix everything. You know, all of these are helpful tools, but they're not meant to do everything. So also when T3 levels go down in the body, do you think that there are times where that regulation is because the body wants that to be the case? Absolutely. What if the body's burning up? Do you think it's going to try to, try to put on metabolic breaks? So this is why understanding hormones in the context of what is this body trying to do? Just giving T3 to somebody, you know, slamming on the gas while the body's trying to apply a partial emergency break is not a great idea. Instead, you want to find the break. Why does this body, why is this body decreasing its conversion of T4 to T3? To be curious about what you can do to fix the more upstream problems of the oxidative stress or of the inflammation. Now you have a more functional way of thinking about uh, the numbers that come back on a hormone panel. Not just low this, give this. Doesn't work that way if you're thinking about systems. So activity, PGC1 activity goes down with caloric overload. And um, saturated fats, so just too much saturated fats, refined carbohydrates, inflammation, peroxidants, inactivity and aging. The older you are, the more birthdays you have accumulated, the lower your PGC1 alpha activity is going to be. And it's, it's going to be, you need to do more to get the same opportunities uh, with mitochondria. So brown adipose tissue, so you have white adipose tissue, brown. Brown is the adipose tissue that's mainly in the, uh, uh, around the kidneys in children, right? You pick a child up and just like, they're like little furnaces. <laughs> well, you know, small, small children don't have the ability to shiver. And so until they can make thermogenesis by shivering, they're really dependent upon the ability of this brown fat uh, mitochondria, and that's why the fat is brown, there's so much mitochondria in it, to uncouple, and instead of making ATP, make heat. So these are heat-producing fat cells. And fascinatingly enough, we can convert white adipose tissue to brown adipose tissue in some cases. And so um, and it, that occurs uh, by exposure to cold. High, highly effective. So cold robustly activates brown and beige fat. Uh, investigators have been looked at moderate cold exposure as a therapeutic approach. And so healthy subjects, daily exposure to 19 degrees centigrade for two hours was sufficient to activate brown fat. And 19 degrees centigrade um, is only about, uh, I think, 63 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. This is not an incredibly cold environment. But just for two hours was enough, enough to make a physiologic shift to go on. Uh, please check my math on the centigrade to Fahrenheit. I did that on the fly. <laughs> and, um, but my, the point is that you don't necessarily have to be doing a Wim Hof ice bath plunge in order to turn on your mitochondria. Some cold, the body is going to recognize that that is uh, a need for the body to turn on thermogenesis. And interestingly enough, it has also showed an improvement in insulin sensitivity, so cold exposure. I think that we're doing ourselves harm by having these incredibly controlled environments in which we live, where we're just hovering at a kind of a normal thermia, 72 degrees or so, and um, you know, or pick your temperature. 
as opposed to having variation. Variation is what creates resiliency. Variation creates adapt adaptability. So um, we, we need to think about the macro environment in which we're hanging out and how that's changing our body's expression of its current pattern of health. So PGC-1 alpha shows that uh, animals under caloric restriction uh, enhance mitochondrial biogenesis, uh, and this is associated clearly with an increase of PGCA1 alpha. What activates PGC1 alpha? Um, we've um, gone through these actually when we talked about what increases mitochondrial biogenesis, because small amounts of mitochondrial damage so will turn on the body's capacity to make more and better mitochondria. That makes sense. Uh, fasting and caloric restriction, uh, exercise. When we see AMP kinase go up, that's what we saw with the uh, exposure to glucophage, all right? Some um, increase of AMPK kinase from the slight inhibition of complex one in the electron transport chain. Uh, a sirtuin will go up. Those are the, like resveratrol will make a difference and that going up. Nitric oxide, T3, and cold temperature.